about uh, how we were going to make the um, this land bank work. So our legislation, and as you know, just for context, um, uh, Baltimore has 15,000 documented vacant properties. We do think that there's probably another 15,000 sitting there, but not documented vacant. Um, and because maybe the neighbors are taking care of the lawn or the windows aren't broken yet, that kind of thing. Um, and also many vacant lots. And this has been a crisis for a very long time, um, especially in our areas that have been completely disinvested. Um, as Dr. Brown uh, in, at Morgan State University said, it has been happening in the Black Butterfly area of the city the most. Come on in. And so um, what we are proposing in our land bank is that it would be a quasi-governmental entity. So it'd be still part of the city, uh, but it would also be um, able to have a lot of flexibility in terms of hiring, raising funds. And the whole goal here is to acquire vacant and abandoned properties and get them out the door to people who will do something with them, whether they're residents, whether they're developers who are friendly with residents, whether it's community land trust, whether it's, you know, whatever the partner is, but with community input in mind. So it's very well scripted what that community input would look like. Uh, and then we've also built a financing arm in there um, as well. So tonight we're gonna um, talk mostly about what's been happening across the country. So there are about 200 or more, a couple more um, land banks across the country. So we, um, we worked uh, with the Center for Community Progress and thank you to the Center for Community Progress for helping bring our colleagues here and for all your work um, on this. Uh, we really looked across the country at really great models um, and try to do uh, use great ideas because we're in Baltimore and you know we need all that we need. So we wanna make sure that we're getting the right, we're doing this right. Um, and so today we wanted to just share with you um, some of the things and victories and really good things that are happening across the country with land banks. Um, and how this can translate to Baltimore City. Uh, and so I'm just uh, really thankful that um, we have our guests today. I'm gonna have them introduce themselves. Um, but we have, um, so first we wanna, we have uh, Brian Larkin who is from Center for Community Progress who will um, actually come up and introduce our guests, right? And then um, we'll go from there. I'm just the elected and I just get to, you know, say an introduction. But um, I've been grateful to also all of the people who have been involved in our stakeholder group, spent many, many hours on the legislation, on the conception of how we're gonna do this, a lot of work. And so this is the beginning um, because we are have to continue that work. The legislation still does not have, um, does, does not have a hearing yet, um, but when it does, we will you know, really need your help. Um, and again, the whole goal here is that there is enough work to do to have the, the Baltimore Department of Housing and Community Development and the Land Bank working in Baltimore on addressing vacant properties. It is that big a big deal that we need that kind of capacity. Um, I will acknowledge also that um, we do have a couple of folks on the line uh, from DHCD. Thank you both for, for joining. Um, so from now, from here, I'm just gonna um, hand it over to Mr. Larkin and then um, we will have a presentation from Ohio Land Bank, from Detroit Land Bank, and also from Syracuse Land Bank, um, who've spent all day with us. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, and then be able to answer your questions. So we're going to have them go through all of their presentations first, and then we'll do questions, okay? So thank you all for being here. Take time out of your day to come to the fabulous Y um, in Waverly, um, and also to those who are online. So, right. Thank you. Councilwoman Ramos, thank you so much for having us and inviting us into the community. And thank you for spearheading this conversation about land banking. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Brian Larkin. I serve as the director of the National Land Bank Network. And I'm going to quickly uh, zoom through a bit of information to help set the framework for the conversation that we're having around land banking here. We brought experts from around the country, from, from, uh, you're fine, from Ohio, from New York, and from Michigan that are gonna be able to talk more specifically about what land banking looks like. But I wanna start back the conversation that before you even get into the actual land banks as an organization, what is the problem that brought us here together today today? And that's systemic vacancy. Communities that are dealing with systemic vacancy are communities that not one here and off um, quick part of vacancy. It's not one house 
that's going for a clause or one thing. It's when entire communities, entire swaths, entire places are inflicted with these challenges. And it starts to feed itself. These challenges, these equity challenges start to send triggers to the market that then reinforce and make statements about value that then starts feeding itself over and over again. We got, we have come here today, that's why we have come here today because we want to disrupt that. We want to disrupt that cycle and land banks are a tool to help disrupt that cycle. And so to, to ground setting, when we're talking about land banks um, for the Central Community Progress, we're referring to land banks, we're talking about a public authority focused on the conversion of vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties into productive use. Exactly what your councilwoman here said. We're looking at how can we take what are perceived, what are really challenges, challenges for the people who are living there, challenges for the people around them, and how can we resolve that? How can we bring it to a solution that is productive and an added piece to that equitable productive use? So a use that helps serve the community that's there, because in order to disrupt that cycle, one thing that we really, really uh, want to put at the forefront is the cycle of systemic vacancy comes from inequity. It comes from the, the intentional or unintentional, the systemic extraction of value. So when we're looking at our strategies, it's not successful just enough to return it to use. It has to return to use in a way that's going to help disrupt that cycle. And that cycle is rooted in inequitable strategies. And so when you hear about, when we get into the nuts and bolts of what, it, what happens and how we're creating our policies and some of the questions you're gonna get today, remember kind of some of the larger challenges that we're thinking about in the back end. One thing I like to put on the front end, land banks are not just another CDC. Uh, there are plenty of robust CDCs doing great work in this community. They're not financial institutions. They're not get quick agencies. So say they're not Rumpelstiltskin. Kim has seen this slide from me before. Um, so don't think that we have a problem. We create a land bank. They turn straw into gold and now it funds itself and money flows from trees. No, land banks are specific tools that... Um, help form that. When we look at the formation of land banks, the first generation of which started before the second generation starts is when you hear a lot of the growth and the boom of land banks that we have today. And many of the representatives today are from the uh, second and third generation of land banks the growth. Um, they help deal with bad properties and many of the fragmented in inventories. Uh, really quickly, I want to talk about where the properties come from, and they're going to get into more detail of that. It varies what percentage, but we did a national survey in 2021 and another version this year in 2023. And over nearly 80% of properties that are in land banks across the country come from the tax foreclosure pipeline. It is so, so very important to have a great understanding of if we build it, where will it come from? Don't say if we build it, then they will come. Where are the properties gonna come from? And being intentional about this conversation as a community, it's not a, it's not just a, abstract hypothetical conversation about, oh, well, we'll get problems. What communities are inflicted with uh, the problems of vacant advancing and deterioration? Well, those are the communities where the pipeline, where the problems are, problems are gonna come from. So our strategies need to reflect that. Our interventions need to reflect that and have direct uh, understanding of what it is that we are creating here. That's these. Uh, the key powers of land banks vary. Uh, and I don't know if there'll be a time here to talk specifically about what's in the Maryland legislation, but I don't have that specifically. But uh, throughout the country, land banks can do specific things. But the reason you create a land bank is so you can instill some of these uh, powers into your strategies, into your affordable housing strategies, into your community revitalization strategies, into your vacant land stewardship strategies. You can acquire tax foreclosed property more cost effectively than without having it. Some have the ability to extinguish liens and clear titles. They can hold property tax exempt. They can generate and collect revenue from tax recapture. Disposition decisions are flexible. They're accountable to the public given status as governmental entities. Those last two bullets are universal across the board that we say land banks are created in order to do those things, to, to dispose of in a flexible manner that wasn't traditionally happening before other systems are too um, rigid to be able to accomplish. And they need to be accountable to the public. So those two across the board, when you have a land bank, those are the values that are coming with those. The other pieces vary based on the legislation that the state creates and empowers that. You get into your greater discussions and as you learn more and get to the weeds of it, um, you can talk a little bit more about the context of what's going on specifically in Maryland. These are the states that have land banks across the country. 
And uh, again, as I mentioned, the, each state passes for many scenarios. You need some enabling legislation. Oftentimes that happens at the state level. It can happen at other levels in various cases. In Maryland, it has happened at the state level. Your state enabling legislation was passed in 2019. Revised. Revised in 2019. And uh, we're in conversations now today about the potential formation of the first land bank in Maryland. There are uh, actually over 300 land banks nationwide now. That number is recently updated based on the most recent survey. So you guys are hearing it first. It's not published anywhere else. So if someone tried to tell them you got inside knowledge, there are 300 land banks in the country. And this talks about a little bit where it's going to go, but I'm zooming through so you can get really to the experts. Ultimately, the reason you want land banks, you want to do something other than speculative sales of property of people who are not invested in the outcomes of your community. And you want to take the worst of the worst properties and turn them into assets for the people who inhabit those communities. If that's the, your understanding, then you'll be in a great place to go on this journey and learn more from our speakers who are here today who can talk about what that looks like. They'll be able to talk about some of the different things and strategies and programs. This is a list of different things that land banks throughout the country have engaged in. You can, this is only a list to show you there's so many different ways that land banks can go. And it needs to be based on what your community priorities are and what you have moving forward. Um, last piece, um, this is my last thing before I turn it over to Caitlin. Uh, the key takeaways, land banks are not one size fits all, but should be an adaptable tool. A land bank is not a silver bullet, but it is a very helpful tool, especially when you're looking at the acquisition of tax delinquent properties. It's most effective when working to address local priorities that achieve great results through strong partnerships, absolutely need the partnerships in order to be successful, can demystify work by adding transparency and um, work with public support so they can focus on their mission. So that just set the ground for work for what the challenges is that land banks are um, created to address, what land banks look like at the whole right now. And now our three speakers today are really going to give you a perspective of what it really looks like. Well, I, I talk more generally about hypothetically speaking and the large numbers, but what you really want to know is what really happens. And from the people that do it, we're able to bring in three amazing experts today who can talk about their years of experience and both getting land banks started, dealing with large scale inventories and moving from the local land bank level to advocating on a statewide perspective. So I really am excited to pass it over to Caitlin Wright from the Syracuse Land Bank. Before, that she, before she does that, thank you very much. Just want to acknowledge Councilman Torrance is here. Um, he's also been um, a big champion of this, so thanks. Go ahead. Brian really built up your expectations, so I hope that we can. <laughs> uh, if you want to go to the next slide. I'm Caitlin Wright from the Greater Syracuse Land Bank in Syracuse, New York. We are actually a countywide organization. We serve all of Onondaga County, and we were jointly created by the city and the county. And uh, we were established about 10 years ago after New York State passed enabling legislation. Um, we sat down and started asking ourselves uh, all these questions that Councilwoman Ramos was alluding to earlier. The, you know, how are you going to get title to these properties? The idea is we've got uh, a lot of vacant and abandoned properties, and we want to get control of those by taking ownership of them. So in our case, we use the city's tax foreclosure powers. Uh, we also sometimes purchase, and sometimes we get properties donated to us. Uh, but for the most part, we determined that the tax foreclosure process was the most efficient way to do it. How are we going to finance property maintenance? We had to figure out how the work that the land bank was going to do was going to benefit the entire community and the city's balance sheet to justify that it made sense for them to fund us because we get these properties basically free for a dollar through the tax foreclosure system. And people were asking, you know, why does the land bank get these non-competitively for a dollar? They're getting this unfair advantage or a public authority created for this purpose. And the vast majority of the properties that come to us are money losers. <laughs> About, uh, you can go to the next slide. The 30% um, of these structures need to be demolished. We have to go out and find grant funds for that. And the vacant lot that results is worth less than the cost of the demolition. And then for the most part, we're selling these um, for very low prices because our buyers are coming in and investing a lot of money in renovations. Um, we call them extreme fixer uppers. These are deteriorated homes that have been vacant for quite some time. And uh, we have, like Brian was saying, a, a strong network of CDCs in Syracuse, just like you do here in Baltimore, that are doing great quality affordable housing projects, but a small number each year. And we had a very large number of vacant buildings when we first got started. 
um, it doesn't sound large in Baltimore, but in Syracuse, 1,800 vacant buildings was uh, nearly 5% of all the properties in the city were vacant buildings. Um, and we just don't have enough subsidy to support all the CDCs doing the number of projects that we need to do each year to catch up with that. Um, so we knew that we had to work with private investors and uh, vet them to make sure that they have the skills and the financial capacity to handle the renovations. Uh, we prefer local over out of town, owner occupants over landlords. Um, then we're leveraging close to $50 million in private investment over the past 10 years. Um, and that's how we could get to scale. So about 30% are demos, the rest are sold as fixer uppers and a handful each year are sold to those CDCs at a very low price and they're investing subsidy in the renovations. Uh, to date, we've acquired about 2,100 properties. We've sold almost 1,300, um, done about 600 demos, which is about a third of the vacant buildings that we started with in the city. Um, and we've seen a 20% reduction in the number of vacant buildings in Syracuse. So we still have a long ways to go. Uh, just an example of the quality of work that some of our buyers are doing. These are privately financed renovations. Um, you can go ahead and skip to the next one. It's another privately financed. Now, we didn't want we didn't want to duplicate or replace what the CDCs were doing already. Um, there are some grant funds that are available just to land banks in New York State. And uh, if you go back a couple of slides to that last, there you go. Um, there are um, some grant funds that are just available to land banks. So we've been able to go out and uh, bring that money home. But we don't want to compete with the CDCs for existing funding sources like they had been relying on CDBG and home funds in the past. Um, these two homes were financed by mortgage settlement funds from the state attorney general's office. Um, the one on the left is a renovation and the one on the right is a new build. Um, but this is a case where we were able to partner with one of those CDCs. And the next one is a low income housing tax credit finance project. Uh, this was a 16,000 square foot dilapidated building. Our buyer was able to come in and get low income housing tax credits and historic tax credits for renovating this. Our inventory had significantly grown up until 2019 and kind of leveled off since then. Uh, we have not addressed the scale of the problem yet. The city's foreclosures have really slowed down in recent years. They are having some capacity issues themselves, just getting them through the pipeline. Uh, we're hoping to see that pick up again in the future. Um, this is showing how much funding we've gotten from the city. I cannot stress how important it is that you're gonna need financial support from local government. Um, we're able to get state and federal grants, and they want to see certain deliverables in a short period of time, X number of demos, X number of new builds. But a lot of the work we do is long range work, and it takes time to do the site assembly that we need to put together construction sites. Um, and so we need some funding that's not tied to short term deliverables. And we've found that the only way to get that is from the local government. Um, and this is kind of illustrating why it makes sense for them to fund us. You know, the land banks are generating a whole bunch of financial benefits. Um, we've helped the city become a better collector of taxes than they were before. So more people are paying their late taxes. Uh, as we're selling properties, they're returned to the rolls and they're paying now and they weren't generating any tax revenue before. Um, the city was maintaining these properties, having to pay for mowing lawns, picking up trash. We're able to do all that at a lower cost and we're taking it off of their, uh, off of their balance sheet. Um, demolished and renovated properties are helping surrounding homeowners by stabilizing and increasing their home equity. Um, and then the renovations, when we're attracting private buyers to come in and do renovations, it's creating local construction jobs and sales tax. And then we're also generating some revenue from selling real estate. And you'll see that's the only one of these that is internal to the land bank's finances. So all of these other financial benefits are external, and that's why we need financial support from the city. Um, we've talked a lot about partnering with your local government. Um, not only will you need funding from them, uh, but access to affordable properties through the tax foreclosure pipeline. You'll need to work hand in hand with code enforcement. Um, we've worked closely with the permitting office when our buyers are doing these renovations. Codes has been able to provide some guidance to them on code compliance. Um, like Brian already said, a land bank is not a silver bullet. Um, and you will not be financially self-sufficient. I think I've already stressed that. <laughs> um, this work does go significantly slower than you think it will. And that's, you know, speaking as a planner, much, much slower than the community and neighbors expect it will as well. Um, so we want to give realistic expectations up front about how quickly we're going to be able to address this problem. Uh, be very careful not to 
over promise because as aggravating as it is, this is very slow work. <laughs> and the benefits of land banking are often invisible to the neighbors. Um, so as we're acquiring properties on a block and getting site control, in Syracuse, we have a lot of small parcels that we're merging together, adjusting lot lines to make them built into building sites. Somebody walking down the sidewalk doesn't know that we erased that property boundary. And so we need to do a really good job of communicating to the community what it is that we're doing and how we are setting the stage for future development, um, because they're not going to see it unless you put a lot of effort into your communication strategy. Um, and then the next slide here is that uh, the amount of demolition funding or other grant funding we've been able to get from year to year varies quite a bit, depending on what's being funded at the federal level, what's being funded at the state level. Um, but we have proactively taken title to as many abandoned properties as we can. Sometimes that means we build up a backlog of demo candidates that we can't get to right away. But having title has enabled us to get more grant money from New York State than any other land bank, uh, because we can say to them that we have shovel ready projects. So uh, for some people, it was kind of an unpopular idea that we would acquire properties without knowing immediately what we're going to do with them. But it has enabled us to bring home more funding than any other New York land bank. Uh, and then lately, uh, as our operations have evolved, we've um, gotten into some different kinds of projects. Um, we've sold off a lot of the better uh, homes that were easy for private buyers to uh, renovate. And now we're getting into the more challenging properties like brownfields. Go on to the next one. Um, we're doing more stabilizations. We're very fortunate that the city gave us a lot of their ARPA funding uh, because we are getting into some more distressed buildings that need more investment than a buyer can borrow from a bank. Uh, so we are using ARPA money to do foundation repair, new roofs, windows, siding, um, and that sort of stabilization work so that the remaining work is affordable for them. Keep going, sorry. <laughs> Um, and then we've been doing the site assembly, like I said, adjusting lot lines, merging parcels together in this particular three block area. Um, over a five year period, we picked up 12 parcels, most of them through tax foreclosure, one auction, one donation. Um, we had to go out and get grant money for demos. We did about a quarter of a million dollars worth of demolitions right here. Um, and then it took a while to get through the planning commission to do all these lot line adjustments. At the end of the day, we're able to serve up eight shovel ready sites to our CDC partners who come in and build new housing. So we're spending a lot more of our time on this kind of work lately. And this is just more of the new construction. There's three lots that we turned into two. And uh, this is another cluster where we put together 10 sites for the county to fund some new construction there as well. Uh, and I'm getting to the end of my time, but uh, I talked about communicating to the community what it is that you're doing because they're not necessarily going to be able to see it. Um, this is a chart that we provide at the end of the year to our city council explaining what's going on with the properties that are in our inventory because there was this kind of suspicion about what are you why are you amassing all these properties and hoarding them and what are you doing with them and uh, so it's very important to be able to visualize what it is that your plans are and share that information and be as transparent as possible about it Yeah. Thank you. Just loading up here one second. There we go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Rob Lynn. I'm the uh, director of planning at the. Can you go back, back to the start? I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm the director of planning uh, and data at the DLBA, and I, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for uh, having me. As you'll see, I've like highlighted the word brief because I have like this much content to share and like this much time. So I'm going to like very quickly skim the surface, but I'd love to uh, talk to any of you after or share our story. I really love what I do, and I'm really proud of uh, much of what we've done here. So next slide. Um, before I, I get too into the land bank's operations, I want to take just a minute of my final time here to talk a little bit about uh, the context of the city in which we operate. The land bank was really born in response to a um, crisis. I want to share a little bit of the backstory. 
So I think this is probably a familiar story to many of you. Detroit was a 1910, 1920s boom town. Um, population surged to 1.8 million by mid-century in the uh, 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 and uh, now stands about one third of its peak population. If we stand up really straight and wear thick shoes, we're at about 650,000 people, um, which is about a loss of two thirds of our population. You know, this is really driven by deindustrialization, GI bills, redlining, white flight, now black flight, job loss. Um, and it's really created a toxic mix that is really like spurred widespread uh, 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 abandonment across the city. And so we all know how this uh, story ends. Um, uh, mass population loss led to mass abandonment. Next slide. And so the city's housing market has uh, struggled for a long time. Um, and uh, uh, over time, the number of properties in public ownership has increased. And I think this graph does a good job of not only sharing the extent that, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, at peak, um, almost a third of property in the city was in public hands, but also the length. This is not a new problem. This has been going on for a long time. Um, but next slide. I think the the city's uh, abandonment problem really came to a head uh, following the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, 2014 White House kind of spearheaded study um, identified 80,000 abandoned homes in Detroit in 2014, of which they said 40,000 should be torn down. Um, and this is really the backdrop against which the DLBA was really um, formed and charged with this job of becoming the owner of last resort in uh, Detroit. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So the uh, Detroit Land Bank uh, 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 is the owner of last resort for abandoned property in the city. It's fairly unique in the country, but a very unique in Michigan. We're the only city-led land bank in the state. Um, all other land banks are at the county level, and so they're more regional in nature. Um, we have a board of five, four of which are appointed by our mayor and council. The fifth is appointed by the state. Um, and so we're also locally controlled, even though we're technically a separate entity from the city, we're still really controlled by the um, local officials. Um, and our inventory uh, peaked in 2016 at about 100,000 parcels, and today stands at 72,000, really with uh, roughly 9,000 uh, structures and 63,000 um, vacant lots. Next question. Next slide. Um, and so we have a team of about 160 people with an annual budget of $24 million to really accomplish this large inventory and this large mission. Um, and we have a host of programs meant to address different issues in the city's housing market. I'd love to talk to you about our nuisance abatement program, our quiet title process, our rehab monitoring process, occupied home sales, quiet title, community partners. But in the name of time, I'm going to briefly touch on just two. Um, our Rehab and Ready program and our Auction and Own It Now sales, really focusing on the auction program in just a moment. Next slide. Um, to give you a sense of our metrics, um, to date, we've acquired just shy of 50,000 homes. Um, we've uh, worked with the city to demolish uh, 26,000 structures, mostly land bank owned, some not land bank owned. We've sold uh, uh, almost 18,000 structures through our sales programs. Um, uh, My Pride and Joy is our side lot program. We've sold almost 23,000 side lots, um, much more if you include other forms of lot sales. We've rehabbed almost 100 and attended thousands of uh, public meetings along the way. Next slide. And so I feel like when I, I, I talk about the land bank's operation, the first question I always get is, how do you pay for all of that? Um, and I, I, uh, our CFO's in the room, I'm sure he can give you a much more detailed uh, backstory uh, afterwards, but I'll do my best as a non-CFO type uh, to give you the quick and dirty uh, overview. Um, uh, as I think of it, uh, about 55% of our revenue is what I think of as earned revenue. This is uh, money we get through our property sales of structures and lots, money we make through our statutory revenue, um, and also grant funding. Um, the other 45% is really money we get from the city uh, uh, through an annual appropriation, and this is really an operating subsidy that allows us to support a lot of our non-revenue generating programs that are so critical to the work we do. And that's really funding for um, community engagement, discounts on sales, our fixed rate lot sales, our property maintenance program, rehab monitoring, and the list goes on and on. And I think this is really 
you know, Caitlin and Brian both stressed this, but I, I really can't stress enough that um, I think when done right, land banking prioritizes impact and outcomes over profit. Um, and to do that, you need an annual, or you need some sort of support beyond just the revenue you can drive from your sales. Um, on the expense side of our finances, I kind of think of it as roughly three groups that are roughly equal in size. About a third of our um, expenses are staffing, salaries, benefits, and things. Um, a third are really our program expenses. Those are kind of the costs with maintaining properties, running our open houses, um, doing our property inspections, paying for title work, et cetera. And the last third is really all of the administrative costs, the IT, the rent, um, the consultants, the printing, the postage, yada, 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 um, that goes to support the operations as well. Next slide. So I, 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 in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of briefly touch on two programs. Next slide. The first of which is our auction program. Uh, uh, um, this is sort of our, our flagship sales tool for selling vacant homes. Um, we host daily um, one-day auctions, and every home is sold with a full structural inspection, cleaned out, boarded up with clean title. Um, we also sell all of our homes with rehab agreements. And so when someone buys a home from us, they enter into a purchase agreement with us, mandating that they'll rehab the home and meet sort of timeline milestones based on cleaning up exterior blight, pulling permits. It eventually concludes with getting the home um, fully rehabbed. And uh, uh, to me, this is really a powerful tool to sort of combat speculation. That's a problem rampant in the city. And this process of rehab monitoring, I think, does a good job of um, selling to people with good intentions who are actually going to invest in the properties. Um, we've uh, 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 sold more than 5,000 homes through this program and have a sub 10% reconveyance rate, meaning the the you know more than 90% of our sales are either currently in uh, process of being rehabbed or have been rehabbed and have not been. Um, was that me? No, no, no. Oh, oh yeah, it should be me. Uh, please mute yourself. Ah. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> And I'll I'll say um, Detroit was really be, be before the land bank's creation racked by scandal in in its real estate uh, sales process when oh, really before the land bank was created. Um, and uh, so we intentionally have all of our sales through open, transparent channels, generally on, on our website, but sometimes sold through realtors, um, so that it's you know out in the open. Um, but then to sort of I think improve uh, outcomes and try to um, support purchases from neighborhood residents and uh, make them more accessible to folks. We have a, a range of discounts, a ton of discounts, really starting at 20% all the way up to 80% for a variety of reasons for city workers, teachers, home people who take home buyer counseling, people who are endorsed by the local nonprofit. We have a different program for people who are developing affordable housing. Um, next slide. Um, so to give you a sense of how the numbers work, I've kind of provided a... No, I'm fine. Yeah, so here, yes. um, I want to just quickly uh, give a sense of the numbers. Um, this is a fairly representative sale for the land bank. This is a house we sold several years ago to a um, a, 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 a firefighter. Um, next slide. And uh, we sold the home for uh, $5,000, but then offered the buyer a discount. We paid for quiet title, a pre-sale inspection. Uh, we paid to board and secure the property, to clean it out, lawn, snow care, and an open house. And just with the direct program costs, we lost $3,000 on the deal, um, not even factoring in admin expenses, staffing, and all of that. But... I think this is a good example of the value of land banking and the ability to sell really below market and lose money because um, this was really a wonderful result. We created accessible housing for a moderate income uh, uh, resident um, and reactivated unabandoned property. Um, but you know this this sort of transaction is not possible if you're not taking a loss on many of these deals. Next slide. I want to just uh, uh, highlight. I think. The success of our sales program is really measured by who our buyers are. 
in many ways, and our home buyers really truly mirror the population as a whole, largely because most of them are residents of the city. Um, but our, our home buyer profile really closely tracks with uh, uh, the city as a whole. Uh, next slide. The other program I just want to spotlight for you very quickly is our Rehab and Ready program. This is much smaller in scope, but perhaps you know very impactful in its outcomes for neighborhoods. Um, this is a program through which we do full rehabs of homes we own. Um, these are really in areas where there's a critical appraisal gap, and our goal is to um, spark a mortgage comp in a neighborhood to try to restore some vitality to the um, housing market. And so we use grant funds to make up a gap between the cost of rehab and the price uh, at sale. Next slide. And I don't present these numbers to you because there is any similarity to Baltimore. You guys are a different housing market, different trades prices. But to give you a sense roughly of how we spend the money and how the cost of rehab versus the sales price align in the city. Um, you'll notice there's a big other category at the top expenses. That's because the houses vary so much, whether they need foundation work, kitchens, moving walls, et cetera. But a lot of the more traditional work, the framing, the HVAC, um, are pretty consistent in, in, in price for us. Next slide. So before I conclude, um, uh, uh, Kim and Brian sort of, you know, uh, 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 asked us what advice we'd pass along to a new land bank. And so I had five thoughts I wanted to share with you before I wrap up. Uh, next slide. The first is that land banking is really a team sport. You'll only be successful, I think, if you have a very, very close working partnership with your city government. Um, these are, you know, land banks sell very challenged properties, and you oftentimes need the support of your local assessor, your local building department, your um, uh, local water department. Uh, the list could go on and on and on. But I find that when you have a good working relationship, these local city partners can help you sell property, but also you will then help them accomplish their mission. So for example, the assessor helps us clear title, but in turn, we've helped put more than $17 million of property back on the tax rolls for them. Um, the building department helps us with the permitting process and with the a dangerous building process, um, but now more than 40% of their permits are from land bank sales. And so they've seen a real increase in their activity due to our sales. Similarly with the water department, we need their help in getting waters, uh, getting uh, properties uh, hooked up to the water system. And we've also brought them a lot of new customers in the process. The next tip I'd give you is acquisitions, acquisitions, acquisitions. I think Detroit had a sort of historic culture of, we don't want that problem, it's a headache. Um, but, the, but I think the reality is you're gonna own the problem whether you own the property or not. Um, and owning the property is really a key tool to responding to the problems. Uh, and so I'd really encourage you to be um, assertive in trying to go after banks, get them to donate their inventory, go to the county treasurer, get their inventory, city inventory. Uh, we, have a, we have a partnership with the probate court. So when people want to abandon a property, they'll refer them to the land bank. Next slide. My third piece of advice is really to um, invest heavily in the grassroots of the city. Um, I, I can attest to the fact that this can be very time consuming and very hard, but also very worthwhile. Um, residents will buy your properties, tell you about condition change, tell you about their neighborhood preferences, help you find buyers. Uh, they will um, serve as your eyes and ears on the street. And we get thousands of inquiries every month that really is a key tool for helping us manage our inventory. Uh, my, my, but my fourth piece of advice is a joke I like to say, water and plaster mix really well one time. Uh, and the reality is you have to approach your land banking with a sense of urgency for two reasons. One is these properties are degrading day by day. At the land bank, we have a 16% degradation rate, meaning every year, 16% or roughly one in six of our salvageable homes become demolition candidates due to fire, brick theft, scrapping, uh, vehicular crashes, you name it, they happen. Um, and uh, uh, you want to really move on them while the property is still salvageable. The other thing is blight spreads. No one wants to live next to an abandoned house uh, and you want to act as fast as possible to avoid having two abandoned houses. My fifth piece of advice is don't expect a profit. Uh, there's a way to do land banking profitably, but that means ignoring your problems and selling all your properties to investors. And I don't think that really does anything in terms of preventing the blight cycle. And so I really encourage land bankers to think about outcomes and think about impact over profit. 
um, because that's really what these like broken housing markets need is new investment to re-trigger the private market and to restore them to private ownership. Uh, next slide. But that's really all I had for you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this guy just wants to be muted, so I, oh. <laughs> I was going to take care of it. <laughs> Thank you. Here's some background noise, Rob. He's muted. Good. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I am Sean Carvin. I'm with the Ohio Land Bank Association. Um, previous to this, I ran the Trumbull County Land Bank for 10 years. And I'm probably not going to cover anything mind shattering that they didn't already hit, but I will run through some maybe differences in Ohio, as Ohio does have the best land bank legislation. I don't know if everyone knew that, but it's it's the truth. Um, you can go to the next slide. You can go to the next slide. So that one was just, we're talking about quasi-governmental nonprofit organizations. So we have the ability, or we have some of the, the teeth of government, but we're able to be more nimble and kind of move as community needs. No. Yo, our how about you shut, yo, how about you shut your bitch ass up? You don't call, how about, how about you, don't, why you? It's rude, man. Rude. Um, yeah, <laughs> the four land bank powers. So we really are, are all doing the same thing. We're here to address uh, abandonment, tax delinquent properties, um, identify funding sources, build community partnerships, and open the, the door to federal and state funding. That has been something over the past especially the last one over the past uh, 12 years that Ohio land banks have been in existence, that we've had a lot of state support through statewide funding for demolition, affordable housing, new builds, renovations. So you can go to the next slide. Um, you can go to the next one. Sorry. Keep going. All right, so one of the things we always have an issue with, so we have 66 county land banks in the state of Ohio. We have 88 counties. Every land bank or every county can have a land bank. Um, some choose not to for one reason or another, but there is kind of a lot of skepticism around what, what we do and who we are. Um, in Ohio, we are county land banks, so a lot of people assumed we were government, and like Detroit, people don't really trust the government. Um, so they they didn't think we were going to be doing anything different than what has happened for the past 30 years of vacancy in Ohio. Um, so one of the main things was first getting all of our elected officials on board because Ohio is funded through gonna get delinquent tax assessment collection. So there is some funding that comes out of the county's budget to land banks. And that is taken from all of those government officials there. So some portion of their budget is being directed towards land banks. It is a very small portion. And in the end, like Rob said, like they're getting that money back tenfold from us getting these properties back to productive use and back on the tax rolls. Next was building community support. Um, so the land, and I'm sorry, I'm going to switch like Ohio and then back to the land bank I ran, but the land bank I ran, like one of the first thing we did was hire community organizers to come on staff um, to go out and kind of like figure out what, what the community needed and how we were gonna address those needs. So we put neighborhood plans together, determined um, what kind of shape every house was in and then built neighborhood plans specific to our organization as moving forward. And then lastly was operating with transparency. Um, 
in the, the last conversation we had, Rob really hit on this, is that these have to be like very transparent organizations. People have to know because there is some discretion. It's not the government where there is very clear procurement policies. They solve the highest bidder, all good. Like we, there is a lot of discretion in land banking and making sure that your guidelines and how you sell properties, your policies, all of that is readily available. And in Ohio and probably most states, there is, we are still a public entity. Um, so we have sunshine laws, we have to do state audits. We have to go through all of the same things as government on that end to make sure that we are, we are not doing anything nefarious. Go to the next slide. Go to the next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Sorry, I'm kind of skipping through this because a lot of this has already been talked about. Um, so this is this kind of is this presentation is geared towards our our newer or land banks that haven't been created yet. So one of the first things we always tell land banks to go do is determine what your problem is. But you can't really like okay, we're gonna create a land bank and we don't know what is going on in our community. So we always tell them like, to some level, you have to go figure out what your housing stock looks like. What does your housing stock look like? How many vacant lots do you have? Who's maintaining them? Who owns them? Are you gonna be able to get them? There's a lot of questions that you can do in the pre-planning stages of this. Um, you don't need complete information on every single property, but you need to have some bearing in this. And, you can go to the next slide. So these are kind of some of the, the ways that we acquire properties. So there's tax foreclosure, deed in lieu, which is people donating their properties in lieu of foreclosure. We can purchase properties. We can get properties off of the state's forfeited land list that weren't purchased, donations. So there's a lot of avenues to acquire properties, and it's really dependent on what, what your goal is. Um, if you're trying to amass a lot of land for economic development or housing development, you might have to utilize every one of these to move those projects forward. And the good thing about land banks is they have that, they are that tool to be able to acquire and hold that land in that manner for future developments. This is just a, a normal house that we get. Um, nothing mind shattering there. They're foreclosed on. They've been vacant for 10 years. Let me get to the next slide. Um, but there is some cost to owning abandoned properties. I don't, we didn't get paid to come here to like harp on. There has to be funding put into these things to make them work because they're not self-sustaining. Um, I mean, this is, I mean, it's an important part, part of this because you are paying for this anyways. And the land banks have to come in, and if you're going to build that community trust, you you you're probably the first person that that the neighborhood has been able to talk to as an owner of that property. There's some shell LLC or something like that. They can't get an answer from anyone. So when you go out there, you might just get yelled at for the 20 minutes you're out there. But at least they have someone to talk to. Then you have to show them that you are different than this LLC. So there is grass and snow, cleaning up the property, removing vehicles. There's a lot that goes into like, once you acquire this, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna make this better? You go to the next slide. So these are just kind of some of the, the general like ideas behind creating your strategic plan for property disposition. There's obviously your marketing plans and community goals, talking with, and planning for those neighborhoods, kind of everything that we've talked about so far. And these are some of the disposition factors that we specifically used um, to determine, these are like kind of our policies on determining how we were gonna dispose of a property. So I'm just gonna read through those. They're, they're not some crazy idea, but it's not the, the standard how it's been done forever with highest bidder gets property because the highest bidder is not going to be the best person to get that property. So working through this in a more strategic way really helps move that forward. You can go ahead. So these are some of the 
common programs. And again, these have been touched on side lot program. We're just giving it to the neighboring property owners. There is community reuse. So your uh, community gardens, pocket parks, pretty much anything you can imagine new builds and land assembly, and then structure is the deed and escrow program, which is people coming in uh, It's a buyer renovated project, in-house renovations, developer agreements. We work with a lot of nonprofits to drive these projects forward because like they said, there's, they're already doing good work. It's just a matter of how they fit into the overall goal and how much capacity they have to do those. The slide on the, or the, the graphic on the right is kind of a, a statewide impact. So we did a study last year that showed for every dollar a land bank invested in their community, there was $4 in private investment returned. Um, so over the past seven years, since we've been tracking this information, we have land banks have invested about $4 billion into the state of Ohio with an $8 billion return. And that is from a lot of state programs. So starting in 2014, there was $3 million invested into land banks to do demolition. There was 500 million four years ago to do demolition and brownfield remediation. Another 500 million this year, 50 million to subsidize the gap between the cost of a new build and the sale price in the neighborhoods that land banks work in. So it's, we've gotten a lot of buy-in from our officials and it wasn't always that way. The, like the, the people did not, understand the value of a land bank until they did. And once they did, they really have pushed funding towards land banks to make sure that we can continue to do the work that we do. Yeah. Sandy, my friend's there. Thank you so much. I want to apologize for those two Zoom bombs. Sorry about that. Um, that hadn't happened to us in a long time. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, but thank you all for your um, for your presentation. So we'll take, uh, I'm going to look at the chat, but we'll take a question from in here uh, first. Any questions? And I apologize that it's so hot in here. You see that I took off my jacket. It's not comfortable. So yes, hi. Hi, I heard, I heard each of you, I think, made, re made reference at some point to the auction process. And I just was curious about what, how you keep the highest bidder between to get the property in the auction process. Because my understanding is that in Baltimore, we have folks coming in from outside yep. the city and outside of Maryland, contractor, and buying and end up um, away from the CDCs. So what's the process that you use to ensure that it stays you know, in the hands of local um, developers or global CDPs? No option. No option. Okay. Yeah, we, I did. Yeah, we don't do, I, we say, I probably said bid because we do take people's like bids for their property, but not in an auction format as they do. But that's a very important question. Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Um, and that's a great question. And I think I'd say two things. You mentioned kind of like nonprofit developers. And also, I'd say, like in the example I gave you on that Tracy Street home, for example, um, we provide a lot of discounts for a lot of different types of residents. And I, I think that's a really powerful tool to try to level the sort of playing field between homeowners and investors. Um, in this case, it was like a city worker with lots of bus drivers, police officers, union members, uh, teachers who take advantage of the same thing. Um, as far as like the nonprofit developer you mentioned, we I didn't get to touch on it because I didn't have a lot of time, but we have a separate program for nonprofit partners there where we do sell properties at market rate, but offer them pretty sizable discounts from that um, to sort of make the inventory more accessible to them. And that's done through an application process, not through a public auction. But to sort of like maintain that transparency, we have a pretty sizable like a review process with multiple city agencies and also uh, our board if the transaction is large enough. Great. I guess it's still unfair. I'm a nurse, so I don't speak the. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> here, when you do do an auction, mm -hmm. a public auction, how do you? It sounds like you have some, some items that you can offer to local people to help level the playing field, mm -hmm. but there's still maybe someone in the mix who can just outbid everybody. 
and they are from outside of the city or outside of the state, and they're not really interested in what's happening for the community. How do you control for that piece? That's what I mean. So I, I would say that, you know, our discounts are our primary vehicle, I think, to try to level the playing field and that we do sell the home to the highest bidder, acknowledging, though, that if you're, you know, eligible for, say, a 50 percent discount, you're really able to bid twice as much as you would otherwise because you have that discount coming at the closing table, if that makes sense. And so it really, you know, um, equips them to, to make more sizable bids than they would otherwise. People can't come in and just overbid. Yeah, right. It's possible. Yeah, it, you're trying to it is. incentivize. Requirement that you have to rehab it within a year and you're going to monitor your progress scares off a lot of speculators. But you also have policy. So you you very well, any land bank can say you're not accepting that highest bid because it doesn't support that local goal. And I think that's the real difference is yeah. they can do whatever they want as long as it's transparent and it's in line with community goals. And they could just say, thank you for submitting that highest bid, but no, this isn't in line with what the people of this community want. And that is, I think, the true essence of what makes land banks pretty special entities to deal with this inventory. And, and what we've designed in the in the one that we uh, proposed in Baltimore is we, we have this new process called in-rim foreclosure. So when the liens get higher than the value of the vacant property only, that they can foreclose and take possession or in this case, the land bank can take possession. And that way we don't have to go to the highest bidder. We can actually work with community on what that outcome is gonna be. Um, and so the question is, well, how do you deal with like poor people wanting the house and who's gonna get, well, that's where, you know, the, the community input and, and all of that comes through. But yes, you're exactly right. We're trying to avoid the problem that Baltimore has now, which is, you know, I explained the, the whole foreign investor problem that we have as well as, um, just getting to highest bid. And then like we're next to Waverly, there's a few big end properties there, two of which have ridiculously high liens, but they were auctioned um, in, in receivership, which is what we've been using. And then they didn't finish the property. So they're still there. So now they're going through in rem, they'll go to a better, you know, they'll come to the city and then they'll be a better owner. So the city does in rem now, and we're going to give the land bank that um, um, that opportunity is, as well. To come over here so that people can hear you. So in the legislation, we had a work group come up with a, a framework that talks about the best outcome that allows us to say, in this instance, it would be better to create a community garden or something that's community focused than to actually do the actual for the actual for profit city. So this is giving a level playing field because sometimes a community may want a green space, not a new brand new luxury building. They want a green space that they can all congregate, be able to in fellowship. So that might be another outcome. That's why we say that you don't expect us to make a profit. This only profit may be a social profit to the community. Right. Yep. Someone had had very good views. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Who has your hand raised? Irene. You gotta take yourself off mute. Off mute. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for this wonderful information. My question is, uh, Baltimore has issues around ground rent. Would the ground rent uh, be included in, in this process? Um, and did the others in the other locations have similar concerns? So um, just like every other thing, Baltimore is unique. <laughs> and the great thing is really unique to us. Um, and so, yes, it would, we could foreclose on the ground rent as well through the in-rent process. I don't know. Do you all have ground rent? You all don't have ground rent. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So, uh, so yes, the whole goal here would be to, to, to be able to transfer the property free and clear. Um, so, and then um, the, there was a question in the chat. Um, we do get this question a lot. Um, in Baltimore, we have had um, similar, we have had some initiatives where land banking has taken place, but not through a land bank um, as, as we've been conceiving it. It's been, so for instance, like EDBI and, or EBDI and, at Hopkins um, or things like that, where there hasn't been transparency and it was 
um, really one of those projects that really never should have happened, right? A lot of people relocated and um, weren't coming back. So people ask, well, what's the difference between the land bank as we see it now and some scenario like that? We've actually written the legislation and learned from our colleagues about um, the, the importance of uh, community-driven and community-led work that the land bank would do, and it's written in the legislation on how to do that. Um, so that the land bank wouldn't necessarily wouldn't come into a community and say, we have the solution. We're going to do this for you. That's not what it's going to do. It's going to we're going to have um, organizers and others go in and say, what do you want? And especially neighborhoods that have never had anybody say to them, what do you want? Right. We've had too many of that um, as well. So um, that's one of the, the biggest issues that we hear is like, what's different? Um, and and that's um, that's one of the big differences. Um, so yeah, so one of the questions also was about ensuring title. We have gone through this so many times. Mm -hmm. So the in-rem, the new in-rem process allows for insurable title at the end of the process. And the reason is because there are two forms of notice. Um, once a case is filed, the notice is sent out, posted on the door. Anybody who is on the title relative, mortgage company, creditors, whoever it is, um, gets that notice. They get a second notice when we're ready to go to court. And so the two forms of notice, the person can show up to court. And it's sometimes what we've seen is that there's somebody who's, who shows up in court and says, oh, my grandmother's house, I thought it was taken in tax sale. I'd really like to do something with it. And then the land bank or DHCD can work with that person to do something with the house to try to keep an heir's property. In most mm -hmm. cases, we are making sure that they, um, that that um, home gets um, into, uh, or the property is actually uh, in uh, where it can be used. Um, so it is a process that we've worked on, I don't know how many like years to finally get in the General Assembly in Baltimore City, um, and we're we're um, starting to to make it work. We're going to get to give the land bank that um, that power. Um, I think those were it. Yes. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, had a program before land banks became current that was really it had many of the same elements that you all have, have talked about up here, but what really killed it was the crash in real estate in 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. the, the, the data that I reported, that we will talk about how many of your land banks are after it. Um, I'm wondering if in the structure of your individual corporation, institution, you have tried to insulate yourself from any kind of similar crash in housing market, because if that happens, suddenly you're not disposing you're you are a long opponent mm -hmm. until whatever happens. And then what happens to finances, what happens to your metrics and your profitability or lessening your unprofitability <laughs> if the, the real estate market goes through another crash like it did in 2007 to 2011. So, yeah. mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Here he is. So, one of the things that is, I'll speak specifically about the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Um, when we sell the property, we transfer the deed. And when that deed is transferred, they file a PTA. So, now the assessed value returns to the value by which it was sold. So, we don't do mortgages. And with that assessed value now being leveled back at the old planking. Yeah. Trying to do two things. And you can just start over because I can hear anything. Okay, so sorry. Yep. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Reginald Scott. I am this I am the CFO, COO for the Detroit Land Bank Authority. And what I was saying about um to answer your question, the first thing is when we sell a property, that property is so let's say, for example, we auction a property and we sell it at five thousand dollars. At that point, when the person files their uh, property transfer affidavit, it is now assessed at that $5,000 value. I'm throwing out $5,000 as a number. But with it being assessed at that $5,000 value, 
coupled with the fact that we don't more hold mortgage for our properties. So we sell it to that individual. They are responsible for fixing that property up. But the second thing and why I believe a land bank, our land bank is most beneficial is because we start, start all our auction and owning our properties at $1,000. But let's say, for example, we're selling in a neighborhood where that market value for that property is $30,000. That individual that's purchasing it actually has already they have already gained that value. We don't set it at 30,000 because we know that's what the market is doing in that area. We set it at a thousand. My question is what happens when they don't sell? <laughs> yeah. When they don't sell? Well, in our instances, when they don't sell, that we typically, as Robbie said, because of the state or the condition of those properties, they actually go to our demolition pipeline and they become demolition candidates. If they don't sell on our auction or only now platform we rush through that in the interest of time but that's where we have community partner programs that's also where we have listings where we list them for a developer to come in and and so it is the combination of all of those things um that we've seemingly been pretty successful like robbie told you about the inventory and what we sold right now as of he's the number guy so he can tell you but we have approximately 3900 structures remaining available for sale and 3900 that are in the demolition pipeline so after seven years of operation, we are finally getting to the bottom of the barrel of our publicly owned inventory structure. So it's, it's been working effectively for us in Detroit. So we would anticipate that maybe that same model, if, if structured the same way, could work here or in other cities. I don't think we're going to be able to stop a housing crash from happening. Yeah. I do not think that's a land bank function. Have this institution in place? How how do you structure it so that it survives? So the whole reason, yeah, it's a great question. I think the whole reason why land banks were created was mm -hmm. because of the crash, right? Mm -hmm. So like in Aspen are created to get the properties where because it's a crash, because of 50 years of racist policy, because of bad investments, it goes to a land bank. And the whole purpose, again, on financial, on budget, doesn't necessarily make that much sense. But by getting that subsidy, a land bank is able to be that patient land steward where nobody else is. And nobody wants to own the property, especially if there's not a market. But if you don't own it, you still own the problem. So the whole notion is land banks are that patient and community-oriented land steward that don't necessarily acquire properties because there's that immediate end user. But somebody has to be the steward to protect people's equity and public safety. And land banks are pretty well positioned to weather that storm because you have pretty low carrying costs. And like Kim said, it would make sense for the municipality to subsidize our property maintenance costs because if we're not here, they're going to have to pay for it anyway. I have a question. Thank you. Can we expand a little bit on the carrying cost part of it? Because when we looked at the different ways that we will be acquiring properties, we're talking about rehabbing properties, then we're talking about roundup development properties. But each, with each one of these scenarios, we have carrying costs. So would the seat would the would the land bank be able to hold in its possession? The properties that are like, let's just say, uh, ground up development, because in the ground up development, you have a lot of different steps and phases that you go through before you ever get to a finished product. And with that comes a lot of carrying costs. So my question really would be, would the land bank be able to hold those properties in, in their inventory, prevent taxation and um carrying costs. Is that even possible? I Assuming mean, that you're getting financial support from your local government, yes. Yeah. And we believe that it makes financial sense for them to fund that work because in the long run, they are getting a return on their investment. It just takes a little while. And even a little bit. So we work with like developers who will come in. We will actually hold the property while they're developing it so that we can also reduce a developer's cost in this as an incentive. Generally, there's some community benefit agreement or something on the back end that we're requiring, like, okay, you're going to get this benefit, but you're going to give it back somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so we do work with developers to do that. It's possible, at least in Ohio's legislation. 
Okay. Um, would, this, would this be a part of the Baltimore legislation? As well? So yeah. Um, so what we're, I mean, obviously carrying cost in Baltimore is, is going to be interesting because the way that we've deducted, we have a lot of code enforcement action. So the land bank, if it, if the land bank owns, pro, owns the property, we're still going to be code enforced. So we could still get, you know, violations and all of that. So um, that is a carrying cost for having all of these properties. So obviously the land bank is going to have have a lot of money to maintain the property, board it up, and all of that, that kind of stuff. Um, but it makes sense in some cases to wait until you've got a whole block before you can actually go through the you know community process or whatever. So we're going to have to eat those costs. But in the long run, right, this is the long game. This is not a short game. This right. is not a tomorrow game. This is a long game. Um, it makes sense for the city because eventually we'll be reducing the cost to the city. We'll be getting more tax base eventually. So the we have we're going to have to budget for those carrying. No question. Well, a, a word about codes. <laughs> like Frank said, this is a team sport. Yeah. Our code enforcement division has been generous with us, and they've understood that because we're That's teeing true. these properties up for the buyers to come in and ultimately do the renovations, they know that there's no way the land bank is going to make these buildings fully code compliant. There's a minimum standard of maintenance that they're expecting from us, and we work with them on that, but they're not finding us. They're not citing us. It's more of a collaborative environment. And if you don't have that, it's going to cost a fortune. Well, I think I think the main thing is just that we want to make sure yeah. that as we're holding these things, that they're they're st they're stable. Yeah, exactly. Um, but also the lawn is mowed, the trash is picked up. Right. You know, those are the things. And we just passed legislation where the fees are like really high now. So um, that that is the what we have to avoid. So we have yeah. to have um, because uh, and and we'll have these conversations with the city, but. Yeah. For the community's sake, right. we also don't want to have the properties be a nuisance. And then they say, oh, the land bank, they can't, you know. So that's part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. just like. One thing I want to add to that, though, um, if you remember in earlier in the slide, I laid up the powers, the tools that the land bank have. We need to think about that again as the powers of the community. So these properties exist, whether your land bank exists or not. These challenges exist. The conversation is. Do we want to add these extra tools and the ability to do these things as well? So when we're thinking about sharing, now because the land bank is there, now we're going to charge them more? Like that, We weren't going to get anything down in the first place until the organization came in. So adjusting our focus in the conversation about land banks, then to your question in the back, adjusting our focus away from the viability of the organization and thinking about how functional this tool is to help us move things forward in a space. So it's a lot of times people ask, what's the average inventory of a land bank? And it's not a, there's not a good or a bad perspective. It's not about I want the most or I want the least. It's I want the tools available so my community can utilize them to help improve our position. So regardless of how the market is moving and how flexible you are, think about would these tools help move forward as opposed to how much we can charge a new organization or what the, you know, what we can create these, this, the land bank is not going to create a new stream of revenue. They're not a new owner coming with this new stream of revenue that someone now can get rich off of this existing entity. They are new tools that the community is now utilizing to help unstick these properties and get them moving forward. And to the team sport aspect, everybody has to wrap their head around that because it's a lot different. It's not a new owner coming in that we're now engaging in this process. It's our community getting these tools, and then we're going to use it to collectively unlock these properties. So we'll, we'll take two more questions because I know we started late, but I do want to uh, be conscious of everybody's um, of everybody's time. Tom? Can you talk about your experience as stewards of vacant land? And that's going to be particularly challenging in Baltimore because so much of our development is rumen, not freestanding. Uh, and reassembling properties for redevelopment may take a, a long time. Uh, are, are, are you all viewed as good neighbors, uh, cutting grass, picking up trash, cleaning up graffiti? Uh, you, you know, do you rely on the municipal government to do that, or, or do you successfully, uh, you know, keep the places looking nice so that the next door neighbor isn't unhappy? I would say that's a very important thing to do is keep your lots nice. Mm -hmm. um, I would say in most of our areas, the, the municipality relies on us mm -hmm. to manage those because if, like Trumbull County, we have 
3,000 vacant parcels. We're already maintaining that many. We're, we're just hitting every property on that road, whether we own it or not. Um, we were able to start a workforce development program where we bring people from the community in to learn mowing, property maintenance, landscaping, all of that stuff. So during the summer, we have um, four to five crews running at all times and then hire out contractors. So I would say that's that's an important aspect because like I said, like if you're buying them and they're just as bad, like they're in better ownership status, but there has to be some accountability on a land bank to address those issues too. And honestly, we, we work with a lot of neighborhood groups that are willing to assist us with that as well because we have built that trust with them. So they'll come out and give us a hand if we need it. Um, and then if they have a picnic or something, you know, they can use a lot too. So I, yeah. I mean, we're probably going to say the exact same thing. I feel like ultimately it's a question of like community priorities and every, every city is going to have a different take on this. Brian made a good point early on that like every land bank's different. And I think that's true in this case as well. You know, the DLBA subsidizes the city's regular mowings of property across the city, whether we own it or not. We uh, make a pretty sizable contribution to their annual mowing effort. And we have staff that go out and cut down trees, overgrowth, remove abandoned cars, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, candidly, we have millions of dollars to support that. I wish we had 10 times more because uh, I'd still love it to look better than it does. But it's, you know, our city council is weighing lot maintenance versus affordable housing and police and everything else. And we've kind of settled on a compromise that I think what I wish was more sizable, but it is something. I will say the alternative is it stays in private ownership and doesn't get moved. Yeah. Well, there's that. It's <laughs> a huge difference. Two quick points. One is in terms of funding. Um, and Brian, I'm not contradicting you entirely, but <laughs> what we've seen, and tell me if you think I'm right, and all of you, when landers actually are functioning, successful, trusted entities, there are actually new funding sources that come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. because programs are established, right? But I think you have to manage expectations, but in every state, Michigan, New York, Ohio, you guys are the quintessential example of hundreds of millions of dollars coming in to that state. If land banks were not there, I do not think that that much money would be invested in those. The last thing I'll say is there's no example of a successful land bank that doesn't have a successful local government. Mm -hmm. Land use can only be successful. Governments are successful. So this is not an or thing, it's an and thing. Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I'm going to give the councilman the last word since I had the first word. Um, but I will just say um, I appreciate everybody making time for us this evening. This has been recorded. It will be on uh, the odetteromos.com website um, and eventually we'll have a land bank website. It'll be there as well um, so that uh, all of the information is out there. We will continue to have meetings about this particular topic. Um, so stay tuned for those. Um, I wanna thank you all for making the trip to Baltimore. I hope you've enjoyed your time. Um, and also wanna thank the Center for Community Progress for, um, for helping us too. So I'll, I'll give the councilman the last word. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to end with an inspirational one. All right. Right. I was just over in Coppin Heights, East um, Asheville, right? Walking because you have in the 2800 block making profits with code enforcement. And we had about 60 work orders put in from a walk for an hour and a half, right? Imagine if I was able to find, able to invest and acquire the entire block and had the vibrant houses of West Oak Avenue. Right. Imagine the costs and the staff time that would be diverted to vibrant, thriving communities. So I want to end this work by saying, quintessentially and simply, when Black neighborhoods thrive, Baltimore thrives. Right. 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 And I want to say this because the conversation for the land bank is about going to some markets where we have senior citizens who are Black women who will sustain our property tax rate and our taxes living next to a home that's owned by someone who lives in Pennsylvania, New York, as well as far south as Florida, or an LLC that's defunct. Imagine if she can have a friend next door that she can be social with, 
she can walk outside and borrow something from someone who's down the street and that we can create a community and synergy that can wrap their arms around her so she can live in place and have friends and family there. I didn't even end on that note by thinking about what we can do when we invest the social capital and thought into creativity. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great night. Yes. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Apologies. Thank you for having us. Sorry, it was so.